Uh, this is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. This is February 1974. We're in the office of Mr. William T. Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Uh, T stands for what? Thomas. Thomas, William Thomas Payne. Uh, Mr. Payne came to Oklahoma at uh, Oklahoma Territory at a very young age, which he'll tell you about, and has been uh, uh, an outstanding oil man and civic leader in Oklahoma and uh, known nationally for his work in the oil industry as well as much as his civic work. Mr. Payne, I, to begin with, uh, this is a question we always ask uh, almost everyone we interview. I'd like for you to start in by telling who your parents were and where they came from, and then from that point, tell us how you happened to come to the Oklahoma Territory. <clears throat> My father was uh, Thomas J. Payne, uh, born in Indiana, moved to Missouri, uh, and from Missouri to uh, uh, Tecumseh, Nebraska. My mother was uh, Ellen Meyer Payne. Her parents had uh, migrated over from Germany in the earlier uh, days. They were uh, early pioneers, uh, farm people, and uh, were accustomed to put up with the rugged life of the uh, Plains areas in those days. Uh, the date was January 26, 1892. The temperature was uh, 25 degrees below zero. Uh, the uh, cold winds were blowing over the plains of Nebraska, and uh, I don't recall <laughs> whether there was a doctor there or not, but uh, that was the birth date and the conditions under which uh, William T. Payne arrived, and it's hard to say which uh, howled the loudest, uh, the winds or the newborn baby. Uh, my dad had uh, uh, worked uh, hard on a farm there in Nebraska, but uh, conditions had been adverse, and so uh, the uh, dry weather had withered the corn, the uh, cholera had wiped out the uh, pig crop, and uh, Dad Payne decided to uh, migrate uh, either to Oregon or to Oklahoma. Uh, due to the fact that uh, my uh, mother's brother, the Reverend William Meyer, was a Presbyterian minister uh, among the uh, si five civilized tribes in Pottawatomie and Seminole counties of Oklahoma. Uh, the decision was made to come to Oklahoma. Uh, we uh, left Nebraska in April 1892. Uh, I was three months old. We traveled uh, by uh, a train, by stagecoach, and by lumbered wagon to uh, reach uh, Tecumseh, Oklahoma, and uh, moved in with my uncle William uh, Meyer until dad could find uh, a farm and uh, some equipment. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, he finally located a farm four miles uh, southwest of Tecumseh. He paid $250 for this farm, and it would uh, probably sell for $250 an acre. Where I stopped, where why don't we go on from there? And mm -hmm. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, Dad got a mule team, a lumber wagon, and uh, proceeded to uh, clear the land. Of course, at that time, it was a wilderness. Uh, he broke the sod and uh, planted crops at spring. Uh, the principal crops, uh, as far as dad was concerned, was uh, corn and uh, hogs. Uh, we would take the corn to the mill and they would grind it and uh, keep a certain percentage for their uh, work. And uh, so what we lived on mostly was cornbread and sow belly and good old turnip greens. Can you describe that meal? Uh, the mill was a primitive mill. I do remember they had a steam boiler and uh, that uh, 
used to run the grinders. I was just a very young chap at that time, and uh, I know Dad had some concern about whether that steam boiler was going to blow up or not, but uh, anyhow, it was uh, a very primitive, and of course, uh, besides the Buell teams, there were many ox, uh, oxen used in, in those days. It was, uh, it was very primitive. Uh, the neighbors uh, joined together and cut uh, timber and uh, built a, a log schoolhouse. The uh, shingles, I remember, were clapboards. They had uh, 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 holes that would uh, permit the snow to sift through, and uh, sometimes uh, as we sat on the log seats, uh, we would have to cover up to uh, protect ourselves from the snow. Of course, in those days, the school districts uh, paid uh, for their uh, uh, the school expenses, such as teacher and so forth. There was no state aid, and uh, all our district could afford was a three months term. Uh, so it was three months term of school and nine months vacation, except it was the vacation because we all had to work on the farm uh, when we were out of school. But uh, when uh, the new term would start, the teacher would ask us how far we got in the, uh, the McGuffey readers, and we would tell him, and he'd say, well, we'd better start over and review that, and so we would and uh, we would end up the same uh, place we had the year before. But uh, somehow or other, we did manage to get some education. I can remember at that time that uh, uh, so many things happened. Uh, one time there was a rumor of an Indian uprising, and so the neighbors uh, joined together, and uh, we... Uh, we slept on the dirt floor at the neighbor's house, took our uh, muzzleloader rifles over to protect, protect ourselves against the Indians. Of course, the Indians never did uh, make an attack. Nobody was scalped, and so everything came out all right. Dad built a log cabin that we lived in, and uh, the uh, seven of us lived in the log cabin with the dirt floor and the uh, a covered wagon served uh, also as a sleeping place for some of the children. Uh, we, uh, uh, of course, uh, put up with conditions uh, and uh, thought nothing of it. Uh, my mother passed away in 1895. Uh, I was three years old at that uh, <coughs> time. She had uh, 12 brothers and sisters up in Missouri that were much more affluent. They wanted uh, Dad to send the children up there, but of course uh, uh, he he kept us all together and at home, and uh, we appreciated that uh, very much. Uh, Dad got tired of the uh, the Tecumseh farm uh, about 1903, and so he bought a dairy, the Morning Star Dairy at Shawnee, Oklahoma, and we moved to Shawnee. And uh, it was getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to milk the cows and uh, deliver the milk. It had to be delivered while it was fresh because uh, we, uh, we knew nothing about uh, contamination or bacteria then. And if we didn't deliver it when it was fresh, the milk would sour. So it was uh, milking the cows at 2 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that continued uh, uh, a number of years uh, when I was in, uh, uh, finally, uh, in my grade school. I walked two miles to school, two miles there and two miles back. Of course, we thought nothing of walking uh, that far in those days. And uh, in fact, uh, I think it was good for us. And uh, so uh, uh, we... Uh, we lived uh, on the dairy there for a number of years before Dad uh, moved into Shawnee. How many cows did you operate? We had uh, 50 cows. It wasn't a large dairy, but uh, it was uh, Holstein and Jersey cows, and the milk sold for 25 cents a gallon at that time. 
Uh, it's considerably more than that now, of course. Uh, I finished, uh, we uh, finished high school at Shawnee and then to uh, Oklahoma State uh, University. And uh, so uh, uh, everything, uh, as far as we concern were concerned, was uh, normal. We were uh, happy. And uh, each one of the children always, of course, had their chores, was willing to work, and was happy to work. I served as a uh, janitor in the Presbyterian Church there at Shawnee. I delivered uh, newspapers, uh, worked as a cashier in a barber shop, and found uh, any jobs we could to uh, sort of make our own way. And uh, so uh, it... Uh, to me, it was uh, it was an experience that I'll never forget, and uh, I, I appreciate those times. I feel a little sorry for the uh, uh, children of this day and age because they don't appreciate so many of the luxuries and modern things we have. For instance, uh, I can recall so vividly uh, the first uh, electric lights I saw, the first uh, paved streets, the first. Uh, telephone and the first uh, automobiles and of course it was much later that the radios and uh, TV uh, uh, became popular but uh, those were experiences that uh, makes me appreciate our American heritage so much. Uh, I might uh, shift to the uh, my early days in the oil business. We might before we do that. Yes, I, there's, there's, there's a few things here if I want. Uh, do you have any uh, experiences, were you given any experiences by your uncle who was a, uh, a missionary? Did he, uh, did he tell you any experiences that would be of any interest? Uh, of course, I was, uh, it's off now. Uh, uh, you talked about your uncle who was uh, a missionary. That also was obviously your mother's maiden name too, I believe. Uh, wh how would that spell the Meyer? The Meyer was spelled M-E-Y-E-R, and uh, uh, my uncle William was well received by the uh, various tribes of Indians, and uh, he seemed to have made quite an uh, impact on uh, 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 communicating with them, uh, preaching to them. And uh, he was at that time living on a farm southeast of Tecumseh. And so he was uh, what we uh, used to call an itinerant uh, preacher that went from one community to, uh, to another to uh, talk to the Indians. Uh, you mentioned something about Oklahoma A&M. Well, uh, uh, during my high school days, I... Uh, I went to the harvest fields uh, to earn a little money, and it was from Oklahoma to Kansas to South Dakota. Uh, we had some uh, uh, raw experiences in, in those days, uh, sometimes running into areas where they'd had a crop failure, and uh, we uh, would have to take a job plying corn at a dollar a day rather than uh, working in the wheat fields. But as I finished high school, I uh, sold uh, ware of aluminum ware, and uh, I recall one of my territories was at the uh, University of Oklahoma. I told the, uh, the ladies there, wives of various professors, that I was uh, uh, doing this to uh, get enough money to go to college, and of course I got a good reception, and uh, they were uh, very generous in ordering uh, the utensils. I traveled on a bicycle with these two big suitcases, one hanging on each handlebar. Uh, some of the deliveries were made after uh, uh, school started, after uh, college opened up. So I went, I went back to Norman to make the deliveries. Uh, they asked me if I had entered uh, college, and I told them yes. And, uh, they wanted to know where I was, and I said, well, I'm up at Oklahoma A&M, and I thought some of them were going to cancel their orders because 
they thought I was uh, intended to go to OU, but uh, anyhow, they were they were very nice about it, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, sold aluminumware during the summers. And at uh, school, we traded aluminumware uh, utensils uh, for board and room, and uh, managed to uh, work our way through Oklahoma A and M, uh, and. Uh, finished there with a B.S. degree in uh, 1915, uh, uh, specializing in uh, bacteriology and chemistry. Can you describe the college during those <coughs> years, or between 1911 and 1915? I would say there was about a thousand on the campus at that time. Uh, now they have something over 18,000 on the campus. Uh, the old central building was still in use, and it is... Uh, uh, one of the historical uh, interesting spots up there now. It, uh, the college was uh, small. It was before the days of uh, fraternities or sororities. Uh, there was a very uh, democratic spirit among uh, all the students. Uh, they, uh, they had a even in those days, the competition was keen between A&M and OU, and I remember that uh, a week before the OU game, uh, the, uh, when they called the roll in the uh, classes, uh, each member would uh, answer by uh, saying, hang it on OU. And, uh, but uh, at that time, we had uh, never won, uh, we had never defeated OU. In fact, we'd never scored on them. But uh, anyhow, the competition was still keen and uh, a lot of rivalry. But uh, they, uh, I was uh, on the track team, uh, finally managed to uh, win my letter in the running the, the two mile because uh, there was less competition in the two mile than the other races. Uh, the wrestling uh, started my senior year there, and I served on, I was on the wrestling squad the first year that they had wrestling. Of course, A&M and OSU has now become famous as one of the greatest uh, uh, wrestling and best records uh, of any school in uh, uh, that uh, department of athletics. Was Gallagher there? Uh, Ed Gallagher had been quite a famous uh, track man and uh, a football player at uh, Oklahoma A&M. He was there as a track coach uh, when I was in school. Later he went to a school in, uh, and coached in Kansas. I believe it was uh, Baldwin University. and. Uh, after I left, he came back and served as the wrestling coach and was very successful as the wrestling coach at Oklahoma A&M. Did you know him? Oh, yes. I knew uh, Ed Gallagher personally, and he was a very, very fine gentleman. Any, anything you remember about him in particular that might be worth it? He was uh, a very intense, uh, quite a student, and uh, it was because of his ability to he had never wrestled a day in his life, but uh, by reading books and studying, he uh, developed a uh, technique uh, for wrestling that uh, turned out uh, winning, winning teams. So uh, I'd say Ed was about as highly a respected man as ever went to school at Oklahoma A&M. Do you recall any other memorable uh, individuals that uh, might be worth recalling at this point? Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, Cap Kite was a classmate of mine. He uh, later uh, went to OU and uh, finished uh, uh, in, got a degree in geology at Oklahoma University and was quite a well-known uh, uh, geologist and oil man in the, the Oklahoma City area for, for a, a number of years. Clay Woodson was uh, another one of our outstanding classmates. Uh, Gettner Drummond, who has served on their uh, Board of Regents, was uh, 
in the class ahead of me, and his uh, younger brother, Jack Drummond, was a classmate of mine. Uh, Jack is, living, is uh, quite a substantial rancher uh, yeah, down at Medill, Oklahoma now. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lewis uh, took over as uh, acting president at the death of uh, Dr. Connell, and uh, uh, the athletic field was named after Dr. Lewis. He was quite a respected and well-known professor at that time. Uh, do you want to skip to the uh, something about the uh, early days of the oil industry? Yeah, well, I might in just one second. I might ask uh, to swing back. Do you recall in the in your early days? In uh, I believe your dairy was in was it in Shawnee or Seminole? Yes, Shawnee. Shawnee. What? Uh, what exciting events do you recall, if any, uh, during the period you lived in Shawnee? Can you think of anything exciting that happened there that kind of stands out during your growing up period there? Uh, <coughs> we, uh, of course, we delivered the milk, and uh, uh, th th that was uh, during the days when uh, we saw our first automobiles. The, uh, uh, of course, the horses were always... Uh, frightened uh, by uh, a horseless carriage coming down the street. And uh, if we saw one coming, we would have to uh, get out and uh, get a hold of their bridles to keep them from running away. We failed to do that uh, one time. Uh, the horses ran away, and they uh, spilled uh, milk all over the dirt streets of Shawnee, uh, tore up the uh, milk wagon. but. Uh, there were no serious uh, injuries at that time. I recall that uh, uh, just north of the dairy was a farm, uh, Indian land. In fact, the da our dairy was on Indian land, and uh, we leased it from the Indian agency. The, uh, it was a gathering place for the Indians uh, from uh, far and near that would come in and camp at this farm, and I would have to go up and uh, uh, drive the uh, the cattle down. Sometimes it would be pretty close to the the Indians, and uh, they always had a pack of dogs. So I was uh, terrifically frightened uh, to have to go up uh, near that Indian settlement. Two, I often, uh, in walking to school, uh, I would cut across the farms to save a little uh, ground, and uh, there was some ravines and wooded area. And many times these Indians would be uh, uh, down uh, in those ravines, and if I could, uh, if I could see any evidence of Indians down there, then I took the long way around uh, to keep as far away from the Indians. In fact, I was a young boy, and I was uh, rather frightened uh, uh, by the Indians. There, of course, they uh, there was some drinking going on, and uh, we I, I never could predict what uh, what might happen. Uh, it was uh, it was a great experience, however, and of course uh, it uh, it wasn't a very uh, profitable business uh, uh, at the price that we had to pay for feed even in those days. But uh, it was uh, something that uh, I think was uh, more or less character building, and I, I have no re regrets over any of those experiences. Let's swing into the oil business, and incidentally, mm -hmm. I asked Mr. E.G. Ty Dahlgren, who's uh, very knowledgeable in the oil, to, to come by because I thought he could be of help in this in portion of the interview in particular, and I knew yeah. he'd be interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, would you relate how you became involved in the petroleum field? Uh, leaving uh, A&M, I, I got a graduate assistantship uh, at uh, Massachusetts State college, and I was uh, uh, registered for a doctor's de degree in mi microbiology. Uh, after spending one year there, I, uh, the dean suggested I was young and I should get some experience, so I went to uh, uh, Detroit, worked as a chemist uh, one year, and then served as a bacteriologist for the city of Detroit. Uh, from that, uh, I uh, received a commission in the Sanitary Corps. Uh, that was during, that was in 1918, uh, and the First World 
war. Uh, I was sent to the Yale Army Laboratory School. Uh, the, the, the great uh, flu epidemic uh, was raging at that time, and of course we, uh, we were trying to isolate the bug that caused the uh, fl influenza epidemic. Uh, we uh, asked for volunteers uh, uh, among the enlisted men uh, for some uh, research on uh, locating the, uh, identifying the, the, the flu bug, and of course a number uh, volunteered. We took uh, what we thought was the uh, in influenza bacillus, and we uh, sprayed it in their throats, their noses, and uh, uh, injected it into their veins, and uh, uh, every way possible to uh, uh, give them this, the, the flu bug. It turned out that not one of them ever developed the influenza, so we finally came to the conclusion that uh, we, uh, we, had, uh, we were on the wrong track, and after all, we, didn't, uh, we hadn't isolated the uh, bacteria that caused the influenza. So I, I got my discharge in 1919, and it was from uh, uh, a shave tail uh, looking through a microscope at tiny bugs that I came back to, uh, decided to come back to Oklahoma. I was uh, tired of the uh, confining and I wanted to get back to the, uh, to the great southwest and the open spaces. Uh, I uh, uh, attended uh, uh, Presbyterian Church. Mr. D.I. Johnson, a well-known attorney here of the early days, uh, uh, spoke to me and wanted to know what I was going to do. So I told him that I was going to look around uh, in the oil fields, and he invited me to come up and see him the next day. And it was through that connection that I got a job uh, of scouting uh, with the North American Oil Company. That was Mr. C.F. Calcord, our well-known uh, citizen of the early days. It was uh, for his company that I uh, uh, scouting, and uh, my first uh, territory was Cement, Oklahoma. Uh, at that time, uh, there were a number of the, uh, the major companies. Of course, the uh, uh, Shell Oil Company at that time was Roxana. Gulf was uh, the Gypsy Oil Company, and uh, the Sunray was the Homa Okla. Homa Okla. And uh, the uh, uh, most of them have changed their names. I remember one experience uh, when the scouts were all together. Someone had uh, completed a dry hole, and it was their uh, considered opinion that all of the oil that uh, was uh, to be discovered in Oklahoma had already been found, and that we were going to have to uh, move on to Texas or some other state if we were going to open up any new fields. Of course, that was uh, long before the uh, Seminole, Oklahoma City, or uh, some of the biggest fields in Oklahoma had been discovered. And it's just uh, an indication of how wrong you can be sometimes in making predictions like that. I uh, was sent from cement to Grandfield, Oklahoma. The, uh, the great Burke Burnett field was uh, uh, booming at that time. They were finding gusher production at 1,500 feet, and the oil was selling for about $3 uh, dollars a barrel. The wells were flowing uh, wide open, and uh, they, uh, they were paying fabulous prices for leases in the, uh, in the Red River. It appeared that the field would come across Red River into Oklahoma. Uh, so it was our business to get all the information we could on those wells. Uh, they, uh, of course, uh, there was almost a civil war uh, over the uh, wide expanses of the Red River bottoms. Texas claimed it belonged to them. Uh, the federal government claimed it. Uh, Oklahoma claimed the uh, everything to the south bank of the Red River. Uh, and the uh, adjoining property owners uh, claimed it as uh, because of their riparian rights. And uh, so uh, the Texas 
called out their Texas Rangers. Uh, Oklahoma was about ready to call out their National Guard when uh, someone uh, completed a, a well in the uh, middle of the Red River bottoms that uh, uh, produced nothing but salt water, uh, thus uh, settling all the problems and possibly <laughs> averting a, a civil war. However, I think Oklahoma would have taken them then, just like the, uh, the Big Red uh, takes uh, uh, the Texas Longhorns uh, today. So it was from uh, uh, Burke Burnett to uh, South Bend, Texas, uh, where uh, Mr. Colcord had some very substantial holdings, and uh, from uh, South Bend to Whizbang, Oklahoma. Uh, the, uh, that was in the Burbank, where the, uh, uh, th they held auctions uh, and sold the Indian leases to uh, oil companies. I can remember uh, uh, the bidding is as high as a million six hundred thousand dollars for one hundred and sixty acre tract. And the fabulous thing that after uh, the, uh, the, uh, the successful bidder. The next Monday would uh, start 16 derricks and 16 rigs out uh, to drill up that 160 acres, which they were so certain would uh, would produce oil, and it did produce oil. Of course, that was the uh, all drilled by cable tools. The, uh, they called them the jar heads in those days, and uh, it was uh, quite a quite a boom. Uh, <coughs> of course, the auctions were held uh, p uh, periodically, and the field uh, extended for a number of uh, miles to the uh, to the northwest. It uh, it uh, produced uh, about uh, a depth of 3,000 feet. It took about uh, 30 to 40 days to drill it at that uh, time with uh, cable tools. Uh, we had around 1,200 feet, uh, 200 feet of what we called the suit suitcase sand. It was uh, the very hard, sharp sand, and of course, uh, uh, cable tool bits would uh, wear out uh, after drilling a very few feet, and they would have to be put into the uh, uh, furnace and uh, dressed out again, which uh, meant a lot of work for the tool dressers. And so many of them, when they reached that suitcase sand, would pack their suitcases and go home. And that's how it came to be called the suitcase sand. Well, it was from uh, Burba, Bur uh, Whizbang to, uh, to Bow Lakes, Oklahoma, where they, uh, uh, one of the biggest booms was on. and. Uh, they uh, the, they talked loud and played uh, rough. Uh, they had their bishop Sally. Uh, the men uh, had a different name for it that I, I won't repeat. Uh, I put up at the Grisso Hotel or attempted to, but I soon found out that uh, uh, I had a lot of work to do, and uh, the halls were so full of girls that I couldn't even get to the bathroom. So. I moved to uh, build a little uh, bunkhouse in uh, Bow Legs, Oklahoma, right next to the Rainbow Dance Hall. Uh, the uh, uh, telephone number there was uh, 22 Bow Legs. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, Maud was another boom town to the west, and it was the common expression in those days that you had to go through Bow Legs to get to Maud. And, uh, so uh, uh, if the company then was uh, Helmrich and Payne, and uh, uh, we got started at uh, Bremen, Oklahoma, by the way. Uh, uh, Walt Helmrich made a deal with a broker to uh, drill a wildcat well on nine acres in the uh, town site of Bremen. Uh, that had never been heard of, but anyhow, 
different people put up a little money, and uh, some furnished the derrick, some furnished the casing, and uh, we were looking for production in the uh, Hoover sand at 1800. The Hoover was pinched out, and so we had a commitment to go 2500. I, uh, uh, of course, considered it a dry hole, but uh, I uh, got rumors uh, when I was uh, pushing twos up at uh, down at Three Sands and up at North Bremen that we had struck some oil. I didn't think much of it, but finally went down there and sure enough found out that the hole was filling up with oil. We had uh, encountered a, a sand called the Stalnaker sand at 2350. We deepened the well a little, and every time we had deepened it, it would increase the flow. And uh, uh, it eventually produced as much as 5,500 barrels a day. There was no poration. Uh, and so. Uh, all of the people that had uh, invested a little money in that well uh, came out, of course, smelling like a rose. Uh, the uh, strange thing that uh, a little boom started and a well was drilled on every block in the town of Bremen, and not a well, not a one of them ever made a commercial producer, yet this, uh, this one well uh, turned out to be such a, a bonanza with oil at 265 a barrel, it, uh, it was uh, one, of, one of those things that uh, happens once in a lifetime. But uh, getting back to, uh, to Bowlegs, of course, uh, the chief entertainment of the, uh, uh, the uh, crewmen was the uh, 49 uh, dance hall. That is something that's faded out of the picture, and of course we d don't have any more oil, oil field boom towns as such. But uh, many times the, uh, the roughnecks would uh, congregate at these uh, dance halls. Uh, the dance would last about two minutes. It cost 25 cents. The girl got 10 cents, and the house got 15 cents. The girls would come around and solicit the men for dances, and a cute little number uh, came up to me one evening, and uh, the usual, want to dance, want to dance, so I accepted, and uh, she talked a little uh, rough, and I was a little surprised. So when the dance was finished, I asked one of my friends uh, who that, if they knew who that girl was, and they said, oh yes, that's pretty boy Floyd's girlfriend. So that was the last dance for me. And uh, that, uh, in those days, it was uh, still the law of capture. The one that got the well down first uh, uh, got the oil. <coughs> they flowed the wells wide open. The big companies had uh, tank farms, 55,000 barrel, 80,000 barrel tanks that they filled up with this uh, oil as fast, of course, as the wells would flow. It was there that the first straight hole tests were run. <coughs> they at that time used an uh, acid bottle. Uh, uh, we, uh, we put hydrofluoric acid in a long, narrow bottle and uh, ran it inside of the drill pipe, let it sit there for some time, uh, pulled it out, and uh, of course the uh, acid would etch a ring around the bottle, and we would uh, read from that the de deviation of the hole. I, I can recall that the first uh, one we ran, the hole was off some 30 degrees, and we were over on another, uh, bottomed up on another lease. Uh, many times, uh, wells uh, uh, would uh, drill uh, into each other. I mean, the, the holes were drilled so crooked because we, uh, we put all the weight on the bit and uh, uh, used no uh, drill collars at that time, and so the holes uh, wandered uh, uh, in uh, every direction. But uh, I'm glad to say now with the, uh, the new rules and regulations that came into effect when the Oklahoma City field was discovered that we have rateable taking now and uh, produce uh, on the uh, scale of the MER, which is the uh, maximum efficient uh, rate to uh, produce oil, 
that uh, they, uh, the oil industry has uh, really uh, come of age and there's no more waste in the oil fields that, uh, such as there was in the early days of the uh, Seminole and uh, the boom towns at uh, Whiz Bang and South Bend, Texas and other fields. Uh, we learned so much, of course, from the Oklahoma City field. Much new law was written up here in uh, writing new regulations. The, uh <coughs> of course, there was a, uh, more oil than the market could handle at that time. East Texas field had come in, and uh, so um, uh, the price of oil deteriorated until it got uh, down to 10 cents a barrel. Uh, the governor at that time was Bill Al Alfalfa Bill Murray, who had guts enough to say that uh, he was not about to see the uh, natural resources of Oklahoma liquidated, and uh, he called out the state militia and uh, shut the oil fields down. And of course, it was uh, there was no legality uh, uh, to what he had done, but he said you couldn't put the state. In the uh, in jail, so he just took the bull by the horns and uh, uh, then got in touch with the governor of Texas and the governor of Kansas, got them to cooperate, and after a month or two, uh, got the matter settled and uh, uh, the wells were opened up and we were selling oil again at a dollar a barrel. Uh, fortunately, we had a governor at the, that would uh, take that strong stand and. Uh, it uh, saved a lot of the uh, independent oil producers from going broke at that time. Uh, he had in charge of the uh, militia his uh, nephew, uh, Cicero Murray. Uh, one of these small uh, operators uh, uh, that was uh, needed to uh, produce some oil uh, pretty badly uh, dropped a steel bar down the hole and uh, uh, that would prevent the uh, closing of the master gate. So the well was uh, flowing, uh, not wild, but uh, producing its capacity into the tanks and claimed that he had a wild well. He got uh, Cicero and the Messina out there and they were helping him uh, produce and get this oil run, which was uh, thoroughly illegal, but they, uh, they, uh, they didn't know the difference. They thought it was a wild well, and they didn't know that, uh, that he was, uh, uh, that there was a subterfuge of uh, having this iron bar placed in this well that would prevent the shutting of the master gates. Uh, so uh, it was an uh, interesting uh, uh, boom, but uh, it was free of, uh, uh, the, the bootlakers, the honky tonks, and all of those things that we had been accustomed to in some of the other early oil uh, field uh, days, and uh, we were up here on the paved streets, which uh, helped the, the drilling contractors and the working uh, people uh, very materially. I remember Helmick and Payne drilled some uh, contract wells for uh, Phillips Petroleum. And uh, we, uh, we accepted uh, stock for a major point of our pay in those days because all of the companies were more or less short of uh, ready uh, cash. Uh, it's off the questions that came to your mind, Ty. Why don't you? Uh, I like this first. Uh, when was the first well drilled up at Bremen, you and Helmrich, Walter Helmrich? What, do you remember what year? The, uh, uh, it was in the spring of uh, 1925 uh, when we discovered the uh, pay at uh, Bremen, Oklahoma. Uh, a number, of course, uh, Roxana then, uh, their company in Cape County was named Co Comar. It was a combination of Roxana and Marland Oil Company. And Comar had core drilled the area and they knew there was a structure there uh, in the early days, of course, oil was found as a result of surface structure or just by uh, luck. 
then they used core drilling, and then later, of course, the seismograph came in. But Bremen was a core drill structure, and there was some more uh, uh, the field uh, uh, extended uh, farther north, and it produced from the uh, latent sand and some from the Wilcox in that area. You started off with uh, Colcard. Uh, how did you go about breaking in on your own? With Helmer. Yes. I was uh, working for the North American in uh, South Bend, uh, and uh, Mr. Helmick was the son-in-law of Mr. C.F. Colcord's, and I Mr. Uh, they were all living in bunkhouses th th then at this uh, small town of uh, uh, South Bend, Oklahoma. Uh, it was a pretty wide open Where home. Was South, Bend? Uh, South Bend was in Young County, about uh, 10 miles southwest of Graham, Texas, the county seat. Uh, Mr. Colcord had a 14,000 acre block there. He turned uh, 12,000 of it to uh, Roxana to drill him 15 free wells. But uh, due to his uh, uh, substantial interest, uh, Mr. Colcord, his sons, his daughters, and uh, were living down there. That was Ray Colcord, Sidney Colcord, and uh, Kadija was Walt Helmick's wife. I got acquainted with them. Walt uh, needed a, a tool pusher for his cable tool rigs. He was doing contract for no North American and other companies. He needed a tool pusher, so I, uh, I uh, left uh, North American Oil Company and joined uh, Walt Helmick in about 1921 as a cable tool pusher at Su South Bend. And then in 22 and 23, uh, we moved the cable tool rigs up to Burbank, Oklahoma. The uh uh, could you describe, tell us a little about Mr. Calcord as an individual, a personality as you knew him? Mr. Calcord was a rugged individualist. He was uh, a man with uh, very uh, definite uh, ideas and uh, uh, a very uh, fine, uh, respected character. He had been a sheriff in the early days. He was a man with... Uh, uh, all kinds of stamina, guts. He was uh, a wild catter and had great faith in the uh, possibilities of uh, finding oil in various areas. He had been very successful in uh, fields uh, in the earlier days near Tulsa, Oklahoma. But I don't know as I ever knew a finer character than uh, Mr. C.F. Colcord. He uh, also was a, a very kind man, and uh, it was uh, an inspiration to uh, work for uh, a gentleman of, of, of his character. Uh, sometimes his uh, optimism uh, got a little the best of him, and uh, but uh, in uh, his uh, uh, he was convinced that he, he could find oil and uh, in large quantities, but uh, it was uh, not always uh, true even in those days. As uh, I've always said, give me the luck and you can have the brains in the oil business. But I can't, uh, I can uh, still brag on uh, Mr. Colcord and say a, no a, a, a lot of nice things and still be uh, telling the rigid truth. <coughs> did you know Mr. Gould, Charles Gould? Uh, no, I believe you did not. not. No. Uh, the um, d do you, is there anything else in the oil that we ought to uh, w w that uh, you think would be worth mentioning? Or well, I just wanted to mention something? the dates of the seminar about 1920. Yes, uh -huh. and then when you came to Oklahoma City about 1920. We uh, we came uh, we went to. Uh, uh, Jack Bates, who was another son-in-law of C.F. Colcord's, uh, joined uh, Helmrich and Payne in uh, 1925, and uh, he was able to get some uh, rigs from uh, John uh, Mebby. Uh, we, uh, we got uh, three rigs uh, from John uh, Mebby uh, that were on location drilling, and we started in the rotary business. I'm talking about Helmick and Payne in 1926. Is that maybe M-A-B-E? Yes. Uh -huh. M-A-B-E-E. Uh, 
the, uh, the discovery well in Oklahoma City was December 4th, I believe, 1928. The, uh, uh, by that time, 1929, some of the bloom was off of the Seminole area, and uh, Helmick and Payne moved their rigs to Oklahoma City and started uh, contract work in this field. Uh, why don't you describe the wild Mary Sudik? I'm sure you, like ever like other people at that time so why don't you describe what it was like uh the wild mary sudic of course is is well named it uh it blew out uh, i don't know it's uh, difficult to estimate the, uh, the amount of oil uh that it was producing it was several thousand barrels a day shooting uh, uh way above the uh, the crown block and of course the winds from uh, Oklahoma uh, from the north or the south uh, sprayed oil uh, over much of Canadian and Oklahoma counties. It, uh, it took some uh, time to get that uh, well under control because they were dealing with high pressures and it was uh, uh, a virgin pressure and uh, 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 a lot was uh, learned in taming of wild cat oil wells in uh, bringing the uh, Mary Sudik uh, under control. We didn't have any operations very close to that well, and of course we stayed away from it uh, as far away as uh, possible because we didn't want to do anything that would might ignite a fire or complicate things, but uh, it is uh, one that is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, important in the history of the Oklahoma City oil field. We, uh, I used to look out of my window in the, from the 28th floor of uh, the first national building. This was a year or two later uh, when we had operations going out there and I'd hear the, the fire sirens and I would look out to see if any of our wells were on fire. They brought the wells in over the top in the early days, and that means that they let them flow, the oil flow for a while over the top of the derrick before they shut them in. Later, we uh, uh, learned uh, better, and uh, by uh, putting in high pressure separators and plenty of storage tanks, we brought them in through the separators, and of course we had to do that uh, as we, uh, the field developed and moved into the, uh, uh, where the, uh, the town lot and uh, a well was drilled on every block uh, to protect the, uh, the houses and the dwellings from uh, the hazards. It's amazing that no, uh, uh, no, mo uh, no more wells blew out and that we didn't have some disastrous fires that could have wiped out uh, whole blocks of the town, but uh, we were fortunate in that uh, none of them got away and caused any uh, uh, great uh, uh, damage, as could have happened, of course. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your civic work, Mr. Payne. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I know you've been active in the last Frontier Council some time. Uh, when did you become active in scouting? I remember my, uh, I was living as a bachelor with Cliff Freitas in the early days of the field, and uh, at that time they had Camp Kickapoo about 14 miles southwest of Oklahoma City, and uh, uh, that was in the uh, early 30s. Uh, they were having trouble with the water well that was producing from the uh, uh, Garber sandstone at around 1,200 feet deep. So Cliff, uh, asked me to go out there and uh, uh, see if I could help them out in completing the well so they could have an adequate water supply to, for their swimming pool and their camp. And that was uh, uh, my first uh, experience in scouting. Bob Billington uh, was the uh, uh, scout executive at that time. Of course, Allen Street, who was uh, later become mayor, uh, uh, gave the scouts a building downtown, and he was uh, very interesting, uh, interested in scouting. And it, it was because of him that later uh, that he uh, asked me to serve as uh, uh, 
president of the last Frontier Council, and of course it was difficult to turn down uh, Mayor Street. Uh, we, uh, we found that uh, the uh, building uh, that he had given us wasn't functional for a Boy Scout ed headquarters, so we sold that building and built a new headquarters building out on the, uh, the fairgrounds. And we are still using that building, and it has served as a very fine headquarters. And uh, of course, uh, we're still interested in scouting. We hope to uh, add another 6,000 members this year. We have about 23,000 uh, members now, and about 6,000 adults uh, uh, serving as volunteers in the scouting program. We have one of the finest wilderness camps down in uh, near Tishomingo. It's 1,400 acres with a blue water stream running through it. We have a 35-acre lake, and the boys go down there, uh, pitch their tents, cook their own meals, and uh, it's a great experience for them. They thoroughly enjoy it. They go winter and summer, and uh, we're, uh, we're very proud of that uh, uh, camp and it has meant so much to the boys of the last frontier council. Isn't that lake named after you? <laughs> it hap <coughs> It just happens. It's, it's uh, called uh, Lake Payne. <laughs> You're too mighty. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what are some other civic areas that you've been involved in that you might tell us a little about? Well, of course, in the early days, we, uh, we developed a... Uh, oil division of the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, that was during the uh, uh, boom days of the West Edmond oil field in the uh, Second World War. Uh, out there, the roads were bottomless. We, uh, our uh, division and committee uh, passed the hat, raised uh, some uh, 75 or 100,000 dollars to put some gravel on the roads to make it possible to get into the location because in those days as uh, we had an energy crisis too. And uh, so it was very important that we would uh, be able to move our rigs and uh, stake new locations and uh, find as much oil as possible uh, for, uh, for the war effort. And I might say that at that time there was great cooperation between the oil companies and the uh, interior Department, uh, Harold Ickes was secretary at that time, but uh, there was never a sh ship that failed to sail or an airplane that failed to fly because of a shortage of oil. Uh, of course, we were uh, had allocation on gasoline then, but it, uh, we didn't mind. We, we, we got along all right on uh, uh, less uh, fuel energy, but the main thing is that we were able to supply the armies, and they, that was the, uh, the element that, uh, that made it possible for the Allies to win the World War, and it was because of a shortage of oil of the Germans that uh, caused them to lose the war. We have about three minutes left. Why don't you tell us a little about your own family? Well... <laughs> Of course, uh, uh, I uh, lived as a bachelor. Uh, I was living out like a sheep herder, and uh, no, I knew no woman would put up with that kind of a life. So it was uh, uh, way in the middle 30s that I met this cute little girl from Chickasha, Oklahoma. Her name was Catherine Bond. And by that time, we were working here in Oklahoma City. So. Uh, uh, Catherine and I were married in 1935. We have one uh, son, Steve. He's now with one of our companies. We call it Payne Inc. and uh, Payne Petroleum. Our son, Steve, has four children. We're very proud of the uh, four of them. There are three girls. Their ages are from three to 11. Uh, one boy and uh, three girls. We're happy uh, we live in the same town with them, and uh, we... St uh, uh, we enjoy our family life very much. Catherine Bond must be the daughter of Judge Reefer Bond, is that correct? No, there was no relation. There were three Bond families in Chickasha, and her father was a dentist. Uh, her father was Dr. Bond, and they were very good friends of the Reefer Bonds, but uh, there was no relation.
Well, thank you very, very much. This has been an interview uh, with Mr. William T. Payne in uh, the offices of uh, Big Chief uh, Petroleum Company, Big Chief Drilling Company, at uh, February the 11th, 1974. Thank you very much.